It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Mines. Welcome. My name is Abu Kaobiuchi and thanks a lot for joining us. I know football is in a lot of your minds. The World Cup final is about to kick off in about an hour. So hopefully you can stick with us until then, which will be 4 o'clock when Argentina take on France. Yes, it's been a great tournament, even though Nigeria didn't participate. But I think the world has witnessed uh, amazing football and hopefully lessons have been learned. In the future, we'll hopefully be talking about what the Super Eagles can do so that this does not repeat itself. Because it was very hard for some of to watch the World Cup without our dear team there. But apart from sports, of course, um, uh, politics is still very heavy in the air. The week saw a flurry of activities with campaigns holding across the country from the southeast to the north to the southwest. There's a lot happening in that space, regardless of what party it is. And of course, Nigerians are still trying to pay attention in spite of, you know, the economic hardships around us. December is typically a time for celebration, but a lot of people are worried about, you know, the price of things, are people going to be able to celebrate? And most importantly for a lot of people, can people even travel, considering, first of all, the price of transport fares, whether it's by air or by road, but most importantly, the issues of security or the lack of it across the country. So we're going to be starting our conversation today about politics and economy. I have here with me, Dumi B. Oluwale, who's an economic analyst. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so so how, how different is it this year from every other December? Because December, typically in this part of the world, we see prices go crazy. People tend to shop earlier, you know, as much as they can so that things can last through, you know, the holiday season. This time around, though, most people don't have that extra disposable income to have done that. Are you noticing a difference? Are prices crazier than usual? I think I saw something online uh, yesterday about half a crate of egg being 1,200. I'm not sure where that was, <laughs> but it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, how are things, how are you seeing things? I mean, prices this year have been astronomical. Um, inflation right now is at the 17 year high, about 21%. And this is, this is extremely, um, it, it has completely watered down consumer disposable income. And that the reason is because people's salaries are not increasing as fast as inflation is increasing. So even if your salary increases today, it's not but it's not moving at the same magnitude. Inflation inflation is rising. So you're you're meeting um, a complete increase in, you know, like a hundred and percent a hundred and percent increase in prices. Some commodities have increased by as much as two hundred percent. Diesel prices alone has have gone up by hundred and seventy eight percent just this year alone. There's still no fuel. And there's still no fuel. There's there's fuel scarcity. Black market rate for fuel right now is going as high as 400 naira per liter. You know, um, a crate of egg right now in some places 2,000, 1,500. I mean, we used to buy one piece of egg for 20 naira, 10 naira. Now, one piece of egg is going for as high as 80 naira, even 100 naira in so many parts. So, and uh, this combined with the fact that we still have structural issues affecting our food production. Nigeria's agricultural sector is not as productive as it used to be about like 60 years ago. So it's, it's, it has become um, um, anemic to the, to, the, to the entire agri sector yeah. um, um, value chain. So we're not producing as much. Then we now move to the fact that oh, we, we're importing smallest and the global commodity prices have also been really high this year. Wheat prices alone have increased by as much as 30, 30% this year alone. So when you compare that, you see that on, on, the, on the domestic side, we're losing because we're not producing as much to meet our domestic demand. Then on the importation side, we're spending so much and that's affecting prices as well. So there's the exchange rate pass through affect the commodity prices, insecurity is affecting our ability to produce more as our Greek sector generally in you know, um, just to sum it up, is not as productive. And so um, there's a lot of supply shocks meeting, you know, our growing demand. And then when you look on the demand side as well, people don't even have as much money to buy as much, to buy the commodities. And then we can't obviously um, uh, um, remove the fact that there was the huge flooding that happened this year that, you know, focused on our major producing states. I, I, I was going to come to that because yeah. I, I think everybody who's projected 2023 and what might come keeps talking about how food inflation will get even crazier as yes. bad as things are yes. you know and the elections are coming next year in february we have uh, a possible census also coming up mm -hmm. so there's a lot of government spending mm -hmm. with regards to those two major um, projects but besides that you know 
food inflation coming? What should politicians be thinking about? We're hearing a lot of promises now. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of not a lot of them are telling us where the money will come mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. But with regards to that food inflation in particular, we're hearing that the flooding will have its effects mm -hmm. in the coming months. Mm -hmm. How bad is it? Is it something we should be very worried about? I mean it is. Um so if we if we go back, you see that the flooding, first of all, there, there, there are two aspects to it. There is the human uh, you know, aspect to it, um, and that is coming from um, the, the neglect of our own dam, because um, the flooding, as much as climate change, that's the other part of it, like the, the weather aspect, where if, no matter what happens, we really don't have, we, could, we can't have, you know, um, um, we can't have done so much when it comes to, you know, climate change. It's, it's just how the world is, you know, going now. And even though we can take some steps, Nigeria is just not there yet. But but when we now look at the, the, the other aspects of it, where we could have actually done something, you know, you see that we just, we, we were, for lack of better words, we were practically aloof with it. We just toyed with the entire country's food basket when it comes to that. So um, the, the, the dam that would um, have, so the flooding basically happened due to, like I said, climate change. There was higher, higher um, rainfalls that, you know, increased the water levels of River Niger and River Benue. Now, you now notice that Apart from that, it was it was exacerbated by the um, um, uh, release of the Lagdo Dam by Cameroon, and the Lagdo Dam also releases into River Niger, River Benue, that cuts across these various states that produce food for Nigeria. So, when you look at it, and um, uh, 40 years ago, as a 40 years ago, when that dam was being erected, Nigeria was supposed to actually erect their own dam called the Dasin Hausa Dam, but unfortunately, we didn't. So. And that dam was supposed to mitigate the impact of the Lagdo Dam release, but we didn't do that. So that's why the flooding is as bad as it is. And we, we've had a lot, already Nigeria's uh, of food production, we have a lot of post-harvest losses. I mean, our tomato harvest, but we lose about 40% of that, or 45% of that because of, you know, um, lack of storage facilities, and you know, um, yeah, and distribution issues. Onions, the same thing. Rice, the same thing. So when you look at the fact that this, uh, 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 Lagdo Dam release, you know, also, you know, exacerbated this issue, and we didn't have our own dam to now even, you know, it just, ex it just simply worsened yeah. everything. So with our post-harvest losses, um, and the fact that it's going to take a long time, because our Greek is not like um, you just go to the you machine, you try to manufacture, you know, it does take time. Pla there's, there's, there's a season for planting and there's a season for harvest. So yeah. it, it, will, it will still, you know, have a, a huge impact on, on the economy when it comes to food inflation, because it will, take, it will definitely take a lot of time for it us is, to recover it, it, from it. It is very scary. But let's quickly go to Abuja, and I think we're joined now by Olufemi Bitu, who's a public affairs analyst. If you can hear me, Olufemi, just wanted to ask you, because like I just said earlier, we are going going through biting fuel scarcity, at least in Lagos and many parts of the country. And we're seeing the effects of that on the price of things. I mean, traffic in Lagos also has a spillover effect on just productivity as a whole. But I think the one recurring theme we're hearing from a lot of the candidates running for president is the fact that, you know, um, the subsidy has to be, has to go eventually. And that also will have its effects on the price of things generally. You know, do you see in these candidates uh, people who are ready to, you know, sort of cushion the effects of all of this with, with regards to the, the Nigerian who's already going through a very difficult time? Okay, um, thank you, Ebuka. We, we already know that in the season of elections like this, we begin to hear a lot of promises. And of course, it is not left for we Nigerians to carefully analyze each of these frontline presidential candidates, of course, and looked at uh, their antecedents, what they've done, and see if they have the capacity to do this. As regards subsidy, we've, um, we have four frontline um, presidential candidates, and two of them, they've been so, um, how will I put it, they've been so vocal about the need for the removal of subsidy. Alaji Atiko Abaka of PDP have said it that he will remove subsidy, Ashwajibola Ahmed Tinubu, when he was addressing the business community in Lagos, he said it is even criminal that he has six cars and there's a boy who only has a just a little tiger generator. They still have to pay the same amount that subsidy has to go. And of course, if you looked at it, subsidy regime is it's a criminal regime. We've all agreed. So it has to go, there's no way to it. Now, how do they fund all these things they've been talking about? If you looked at this presidential candidate, like I said, I always tell people when you want to, as an HR professional also, which I am, when you want to employ someone, 
part of what you look out for is, um, is experiences. And there's a certain presidential candidate is saying, okay, I have done it before. Another presidential candidate is saying, okay, I've also done it before at the higher level. So the question for Nigerians is to now look at their policy document, which they have presented to us, looking at the policy document and ask them the tough questions. So by the time they come, um, um, there's a debate, town hall meetings, we need to begin to ask them that, okay, this $10 billion you talked about, how do you intend to get these funds from? Considering the global economic um, issue we are having and the global security challenges, all these things have a way of nose diving into our own economy. So we need to start asking them the real question. It is not just enough to say, I will do this, I will do this. Most of these are based on rhetorics and what people want to hear. But we need to move away from what people want to hear and ask them the tough questions that where do you get this money from? How do we increase funding? Is it by okay. opening the, um, the tax net? Yes. So I, I hear you on that, but I think the, the problem a lot of Nigerians also have is how do we ask these questions? I mean, we have candidates who have re re repeatedly been, you know, in the media space answering questions. We have some others who have said they, are, they have their own game plan on speaking to the public. You know, many of them have refused to debate, and others have said, well, if everybody is not there to debate, I'm not going to debate. So it even makes it harder to ask these questions. But even if we ask these questions, I, I think the one thing I always ask, and I think I've even asked you this a few times, is, is after May 29, and how do we then make sure that they do those things that we've asked them to do, especially considering the crunch that we're going into in the coming year? What are Nigerians supposed to be asking at this time? How do they ask it and how do we hold them accountable? Well, um, even the way our constitution has been structured may, has made it a bit difficult in making all these presidential candidates, all the venture winners, accountable to all of the electoral promises. So like I always tell people, it takes um, a good art to make a promise, but it takes integrity to fulfill the promise. I can come out and tell you, Ebuka, hey, okay, by tomorrow, I'll give you five million naira. And tomorrow we come, I have the five million naira, I even have it in excesses, and you're calling me, I'm not picking my call. That shows that I lack integrity. So and I think one of the major things we need to look out for is we need to be careful in this 2023 general election because it's going to be... Uh, a game changer, and it is pivotal for us, most especially the youth. So we need to look at how do we engage. Okay, if a particular candidate is saying, okay, you know what? I want to engage people based on their, uh, their close groups. For example, I want, to I want to engage the creative industry. I want to engage the uh, data economy industry. Okay, now let us set up people in those industries who will go to such engagement, who will go to such meeting and ask the questions we need to ask, because we need to ask them these questions. And every Nigerian politicians are not to be trusted. We all know that. But then, we cannot always throw, we can't throw away the, the bathwater with the baby. So we still have to get engaged. And that's why I always tell people that all Tyrari needs to have a foothold is when people of good conscience keep quiet. So which means the civil society, religious bodies, organizations, individuals, even the corporate organizations need to start asking this question. Whichever way we have the opportunity to, have the, to ask the question, if a candidate says, okay, I am doing stakeholders engagement with the creative industry, let us encourage the creative industry guys, go there, ask so, so, and so question. And don't forget, the questions must link to three major things, economy, Economic development, infrastructure development, and security. Reason why I mention security being the third is that when there's economic development and infrastructure development, security can be insecurity in our nation can be nipping the board. So we need to engage them, find a way. You know, there's this popular saying they would say, um, if if uh, Muhammad cannot go and meet the mountain, <laughs> the mountain should go and meet Muhammad, whichever way it is said, either it is alternative way. Which means if you are serious about our life, if you are serious about this country, we need to engage them. Whichever format or strategy each of the candidates want to use, the most important thing is let us give us a commitment to say okay. this is what I will do and this is how I intend to achieve it. Okay, I'll come back to you. Let me let me come to the movie now because I, I know I mean you are very heavy on the economy. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, that's probably the biggest issue going into the next elections. Even yes. though insecurity is also a very heavy one, of yes. course. What uh, I don't know if you've seen at least the manifesto of the four major candidates mm -hmm. now. Uh, has anything jumped out at you? Uh, does it give you hope? You know that it, 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 whoever wins in 20, 2023, there is some pathway to us recovering from where we are, or do you just see it and it looks like one of those documents that you know. Is like okay, just 
copy and paste. <laughs> okay, so let me just put this caveat that all of the manifestos um, are very filled with a lot of promises. Um, they tell us what they want to do, but they do not tell us how they intend to do it. So, um, for example, I, Apart from that, um, you also look at the fact that each candidate somewhat has a theme regarding what they want to do and how they intend to achieve, not, not exactly how they intend to, but they have a theme regarding their uh, manifestos. And it can give you a hint as an economist or even, even just the general public, it can give you a hint as to how Nigeria will look like under this person's presidency. Now, a few things that have jumped out for us as economists or as analysts, when you look at the, let me start with the um, APC manifesto. When you look at the APC manifesto, there are two things. The APC wants to achieve a growth rate of 10% for the Nigerian economy. Fantastic. It's, it's, it's some, I mean, we've achieved it before. But when we look at the realities of the current situation of the economy, side by side with what's happening globally, you see that it's almost unachievable right now. And the question is, how do they intend to do it? And they mention, number one, we're going to keep spending. We're going to keep spending. So how do we keep spending when already we're short of funds? Nigeria has a big liquidity problem. We do not, we're not generating enough revenue. So meaning that we're going to go back to increasing borrowing. We already have, we're already, uh, our debt levels are already at, you know, unprecedented levels. So meaning that we're going to keep resorting to borrowing. Who is going to borrow to us when we've, they've not seen us spend responsibly? So those are very, those are like a few gray areas regarding that. And it's, it's very more, it's, 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 it's more striking when you realize that um, to achieve this growth rate, they're telling us that we're going to keep spending regardless, and there are no checks and balances. There's another thing that jumps out in the ABC manifesto saying that monetary policy must serve fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, you look at government spending and taxation, and you, monetary policy that is supposed to be an independent you know, body on its own, but saying that it must serve fiscal policy, that's another gray area. How, meaning that we're going to probably keep printing more money. We've already seen ways and means advances jump to about 20, 20 trillion naira, and that is complete. That completely obliterates the CBN's uh, 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 fiscal act. So already, it's it's there are a lot of questions regarding that. The when you look at the the. Um, the PDP manifesto. You see that, yes, to an extent, they, they do understand the issues plaguing the country. But like I said, how do we intend to achieve these goals and promises that you're, you know, putting in your document? Okay. It's still, there's still a lot of, you know, question marks there. When you look at the, then when you go to the um, uh, Labour Party manifesto, yes, there's still question marks on how they intend to achieve some of these goals. But when you hear, the, for example, the, the, the uh, uh, Labour Party um, is saying that they're going to, ensure that they increase our revenue generation capacity by focusing on agri um, commodities that we have comparative advantage in. Ordinary, ordinarily mentioning comparative advantage tells you that this person or this party, they have an understanding of where to at least push their strategy towards in terms okay. of generating revenue and diversifying our revenue base. Subsidy removal was a recurring, thing, recurring theme amongst um, all uh, 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 parties. The then, uh, yes, across all manifestos. Then when you look at also for the um, Labour Party, they also mentioned um, something along the lines of um, improving our um, um, improving our industrial, you know, capacity, improving our industrial capacity, which is extremely good. I mean, when you look at the fact that Nigeria has to do a lot more when it comes to uh, um, manufacturing, they also mentioned that. Okay, we need to. Sorry, sorry to cut yes, you. Let's just yeah. quickly go to Lefemi because we're almost out of time. Okay. For me, very quickly now, uh, the CBN has come up with a lot of policies in the last couple of months, whether it's redesigning the NARA or restricting, you know, the rates of uh, withdrawals from banks, the amount of cash you can carry around. You know, and inflation has been quite, quite, quite a crazy one this year. Um, do you see these policies having an effect? There are people who are very wary about how that's going to work out. Do you see these candidates carrying on, you know, this, these policies? Because the CBN governor did say that this happened because Mr. President approves them. Do you think there's something that's going to work in some way in 2023 for us? Well, I think um, that is one of the challenges we have as a growing nation because even in the same party, we've seen governors come in and begin to change policies of the previous administrations. And I think we need to rejig and give some independence to some of our institutions. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem we have in Nigeria is weaker institutions. And before I even speak more on that, let me just speak um, in a breath to what do maybe mention as regards the source of funding. And I think one of the candidates, and I think the APC candidate, talks about something. He said he talks about revenue generation when he talks about spending. 
that he's going to increase the tax net. And, and I think that's one of the bragging rights. He has always been saying that, look at Lagos. I made Lagos IGR at 500 million. I increased it to also a billion. And I think with that, it can also, and of course, by the time we come, um, block the leakages, we shouldn't have issue with that, which now brings us back to what the CBN governor is doing. To some extent, if you looked at it, I think we Nigerians, most of us are not, we react emotionally to issues that happen in our country, most especially when we don't like the face of um, the person doing it. If you looked at it, they told you the Nera design is not just about we want to change the color of the Nera. No, it has some um, monetary policy that is to say they want to reduce the flow of Nera, which is outside the financial institutions. And if you looked at it, these are some of the things that we need to put in place. And also, of course, we, I will encourage the new administration that will be coming in, either of the, um, the presidential candidate from the 18 political parties we have, should also, I will reach them to sustain some of the monetary policy right. of this um, MFOLA-led CBN government. Because okay. if you looked at it, they okay. are taking us in the path to the right direction. We might okay. not get it, but it's a systemic approach. Okay. All right. It's a bit shaking her head here furiously, <laughs> but unfortunately, we're out of time. Maybe we'll have to get you guys back together to go back and forth on this, because Nigerians need conversations like this to actually help I'll them I'll be in Lagos next week. We could have the conversation All right. together. That, I'm open that's to it, it as let, well. Let's look forward to that. And thanks a lot for joining us. Don't just stand like